So good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're just about to get started. Um, I see that uh, we have participants slowly joining us, so we'll uh, slowly get started here. It's, um, if you have any questions during the webinar, we're in um, webinar mode, so participants can't freely speak on their own. But if you've got questions during the presentation, feel free to use uh, the Q&A function or the chat, chat box. And um, just to note that we'll also be recording this meeting. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amy Burt, and I'm the lead guideline development methodologist on the recently published Vascular Access Second Edition Best Practice Guideline here at the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. And I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. And I would like to welcome you to this second webinar in our two webinar series as we discuss the implementation and evaluation of one of our newest best practice guidelines, Vascular Access Second Edition, which as I mentioned, was published this past June. So today's webinar will be presented by some of those involved in developing this guideline, including our two fantastic co-chairs of the guideline, Dr. Nancy Moreau, CEO of PIC Excellence, and Darlene Murray, Interprofessional Education Specialist at the Hospital for Sick Children. And presenters will also include Catherine Wallace, a Senior Manager on the Implementation Science Team at RNAO, Christina Medeiros, the Senior Manager of Evaluation and Monitoring at RNAO, and my fellow Guideline Development Methodologist, Christine Buchanan. So the objectives of today's webinar are to briefly review the material we covered last week during webinar one, as well as to describe implementation strategies related to the BPG. And then we're gonna highlight and provide an overview of evaluation measures. So before we begin, I'll just give a little bit of background on RNAO for those who might not be familiar. So RNAO is the professional organization representing RNs, uh, registered nurses, nurse practitioners, and nursing students in Ontario. And we're the strong, credible voice that leads the nursing profession to implement, influence and promote healthy public policy and clinical excellence. So a signature program of RNAO is the International Affairs and Best Practice Guideline Center, which houses this best practice guideline program. And RNAO's BPGs are actively implemented across Canada, as well as internationally through our Best Practice Spotlight Organization, often called BPSO. The Health Policy Program is another core pillar of RNAO. So the RNAO BPG program was launched in 1999 and it's funded by the Government of Ontario. The purpose is to develop, disseminate, and actively support the uptake and sustainability of evidence-based clinical, healthy work environment and system BPGs, as well as to evaluate their impact on patient, organizational, and health system outcomes. As mentioned, a signature program of RNAO is the Best Practice Guideline Program, which includes three integrated pillars, guideline development, guideline implementation and sustainability, and guideline monitoring and evaluation. These pillars inform one another and work in sync to improve outcomes for persons receiving care, providers, organizations, and systems. During this webinar, we'll mostly focus on the pillars of guideline implementation and sustainability, as well as monitoring and evaluation. In webinar one of the series, we focused on guideline development. And in case you missed webinar one, you can find it uh, recorded and saved on the RNAO website. So just as a reminder, the Vascular Access Second Edition Best Practice Guideline uh, can be found on the RNAO website and you can download it for free on on the website and uh, we can put the link in the chat box for you. And this is also where you can find last week's webinar and it's where you can find today's webinar, um, which we hope to upload in the next couple of days in case you have to step out early or you wish to share with any colleagues. 
So next, I'm going to pass it over to our co-chair, Nancy. Welcome, everybody. Um, the guideline purpose for um, the best practice guidelines. Um, thank you, Amy, for that good introduction. In the next few slides, we want to cover some of more high level overview that provides you with more information and structure on the best practice guidelines specific to the purpose and the scope. Uh, we're gonna cover some main recommendation areas and the methodology that was used to develop the guidelines. So specific to the purpose, the main purpose of this guideline is to provide nurses, including nurse practitioners, registered nurses, registered practical nurses, nursing students, and the interprofessional team members such as researchers, educators, administrators, executives, and persons with vascular access devices with evidence-based recommendations, the resources and information related to the insertion, assessment, and maintenance of all vascular access devices. So these recommendations cover all the patient population areas, including infants zero to one year, pediatric patients one to 18 years, and our adult populations 18 years and older. The purpose of the guideline is to promote consistency and excellence in clinical care, policies and procedures, and within education, all leading to optimal health outcomes. So next is the scope of practice. In terms of the guideline scope, this best practice guideline is apl applicable to all care settings. It covers care settings that include primary care, long-term care, our acute care, and community care. It also covers all healthcare providers who insert, assess, or maintain vascular access devices, as we already mentioned within the purpose. This includes all of our nursing areas that I've already mentioned. And then within the domains of nursing, this is covered within the scope as well, specific to clinical, practice, research, education, and administration. These recommendations are included for all vascular access devices, including short peripheral vascular access devices, central such as PIC lines, and other central venous access devices, including implantable ports, peripheral arterial devices, and phlebotomy devices. So next, included in the guideline are at least one good practice statement and six recommendation areas. Based on the grade methodology, the good practice statement did not require a systematic review and focuses on completion of a systematic assessment prior to inserting a vascular access device. The six recommendation areas that systematic reviews were conducted on were within education, vascular access specialist, blood draws, a daily review of peripheral vascular access devices, the use of visualization technologies, and pain management. We won't be going into each recommendation in detail during this webinar, since most of that was covered in the previous webinar that was recorded and is accessible, as Amy has already told you. However, you'll be able to, to access those webinars at any point in time, the first or the second, and you can access the complete second edition vascular access best practice guideline at the link that was included in the chat box. You can also go to the RNAO webpage and search for vascular access second edition and it will pop right up so that you can download that PDF of all 164 pages for easy reference. Included within the guideline, you will find an algorithm that you see here. This appendix in the basic practice guideline provides the structure of the recommendation workflow within an algorithm. This algorithm is located on page 153 of that document that we've already been talking about. The algorithm provides an easy workflow for nurses and other healthcare providers to follow in relation to each recommendation that's included in the best practice guide. The top of the algorithm starts with providers caring for all persons requiring vascular access device procedures. Next, 
the good practice statement from the best practice guideline includes completing a systematic assessment, assessment of the patient and the process in order to determine the best vascular access device for that patient. The workflow then asks if the person is a difficult to access patient. That helps to guide the next decisions. If the answer is yes, it flows down to the left with the recommendation 3.1 to consider referral to a vascular access specialist or a specialist team. And then recommendation 6.1 and 6.2 also incorporate considering the use of visualization technologies or ultrasound for that vascular access device insertion. If the answer to difficult venous access is no, it flows to the right and asks whether the person requires a peripheral arterial catheter, in which case the recommendation 6.1 and 6.2 may also be applicable. The box in the middle states to continue with the procedure and routinely assess the person as their condition changes. <coughs> Next, it flows to recommendation 7.1 and 7.2 on offering pharmacological and non-pharmacological pain management. The workflow then divides left and right again. <laughs> Excuse me. Depending on whether the healthcare provider <clears throat> is performing a blood draw or a vascular access insertion. Finally, at the bottom of the algorithm is the recommendation. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> is a recommendation 1.1 <coughs> outlining that health providers should provide a comprehensive health teaching <coughs> to persons that, and their families and caregivers about their vascular access device <coughs> and should document all care and teaching that's provided. And this should be included as part of that patient's assessment and documentation. So it's now my pleasure to pass along the presentation to Catherine so that she can share with us the specifics of implementing the process for best practice guideline. Thank you, Nancy. Hope you can grab a drink there. So and we're gonna talk now about implementation considerations for this guideline. I'm really excited to um, have this opportunity um, as Amy and Christine have indicated. Um, this is a new approach that we're taking to BPD um, guideline release and really wanting to emphasize that um, reading the guideline isn't enough as far as creating practice change. So what what approaches can we take in order to make best practices, um, BPGs are best practices? How do we get there? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about more of the theory, introduce you to our new leading change toolkit. And then Darlene Murray, she's gonna share with us how um, this BPG, parts of this BPG have been implemented in her site. So um, first let's have a look at a little bit about implementation. Thanks Amy. So just to define what implementation is, we've taken this definition from Implementation Science Journal, a journal that was released in 2006, in part because there was recognition that the creation of knowledge tools, products, evidence, like our BPGs, that we needed a better understanding of what process will we use as care providers, as educators, researchers, clinicians, etc., um, to take guidelines and actually put them into clinical practice. So by definition, implementation, these are the methods, the approaches that we're using to adopt and integrate evidence-based practice, interventions and policies into routine healthcare and public health settings. We came to realize quickly that having guidelines, having these summaries of evidence-based practice wasn't enough as far as making the behavior changes that we needed to um, in order then to create best practices. So hence the study of the implementation science and the need to focus on implementation approaches. So as far as what impact does implementation of any evidence-based resource, knowledge tool, et cetera, have 
um, including our best practice guidelines. We know that it can reduce variation in care. Now we say that um, assuming that we have actively implemented the best practice guideline. So not enough for each of us to read this guideline, all 160 plus pages, but we actually then need to have some processes in place in which then we can ensure that we are all then consistently following best practices and therefore reducing variation in care. Um, through implementation, then it's a way then of taking the research evidence, all the evidence that's been summarized in this best practice guideline, and actually using it in the point of care, uh, consider also using it for documentation, for policy, for purchasing, for orientation, etc. Lots to think about. It's complex. Um, but doable. Um, it helps us with decision making. So we can think about then how are we going to actually use this at the point of care um, and uh, help then those we care for to make decisions as well regarding best practices. Um, it better ensures that we stop interventions that have little effect or cause harm, certainly something we would not want to do for the reason that we continue to update our BPGs and reduce costs or at least find the most cost effective ways in which to provide uh, care. Next slide. All right, so what, as an approach to implementation, we consider using frameworks, frameworks to help support the uptake and sustainability of best practice guidelines. So a framework, by definition, uh, is when we do a study of implementation and all of the related concepts. What are all the related elements or components of implementation, those supports, those methods, approaches, to uptake of a guideline. So it helps us to better understand what's involved in the change process to support knowledge translation, to address the knowledge practice gap or the difference between our current practice and that which is expressed in a best practice guideline. And frameworks kind of act like a roadmap or a compass. They give us some guidance as to how to go about this change approach tells us, again, what are all the related components? What are the starting points? So that as we enter into this, what can be a complex process of changing practice, um, where do we get started? How do we make sure that we are doing the best we can in order to achieve and sustain best practices? So frameworks can be very helpful. So in the Leading Change Toolkit, this is a brand new resource that we've released at RNAO in partnership with Healthcare Excellence Canada, formerly CPSI. Um, and this is our third edition of the um, toolkit. Uh, so it's a foundational implementation resource that's available online to anyone um, at the rnao.ca forward slash leading dash change dash toolkit. Um, and thanks, Christine has put that in the website, uh, or in the chat box rather. Uh, when you look on the RNAO uh, website um, under the BPG tab, uh, under um, on the left-hand side, there is a menu and under implementation, you will find there a link to the leading change toolkit. It's available to anyone. And you can see the purpose of the leading change toolkit to help change agents and change teams make lasting improvements in healthcare. So the emphasis here is on positive outcomes with the integration of evidence, including from our BPGs. In the Leading Change Toolkit then, uh, you will find what's new is the integration of not one, but two frameworks. So those of you who are familiar with our second edition of the toolkit will know that it featured the Knowledge to Action Framework. But in addition, in our third edition, we have the Social Movement Action Framework. I'm gonna talk about both of these frameworks, but I want you to think about it's like having uh, two for the price of one almost, having um, two frameworks that give you another understanding of uh, approaches, more strategies that you can use to support implementation and in that way to accelerate your success. So we're gonna look at each of these frameworks. So as I indicated, the Knowledge to Action Framework, some of you are familiar with this because uh, we use this in our second edition of the toolkit and it is a frequently cited framework. Um, developed by Dr. Ian Graham and colleagues in 2006. And we were very fortunate to have Dr. Ian Graham participate as an expert panel member uh, for the Leading Change Toolkit. So if we had any questions regarding this framework, we were in great hands with his participation. Um, so as many of you are aware, um, the Knowledge to Action Framework includes these two components, as you can see in the graph, um, that begins with this knowledge creation 
uh, process in which we have a knowledge inquiry or research question, and then the knowledge synthesis, the same work, this is the same process that we use in our BPGs, in which we have a systematic review, quality appraisal of evidence that then results in the production of a knowledge tool or product, and for us that would be our best practice guidelines. What the knowledge to action framework emphasizes is that the production of a BPG, for example, is not the end of implementation. In fact, really, it's the beginning of that process. So what are the active phases that we can take in order to achieve a practice change and sustain it? And so the knowledge to action framework, a systematic structured process model, um, lays it out in seven key phases. Beginning often with, but doesn't have to be, the identify the problem and determining the no do gap. What's the difference between our current state of practice and what the best practice guideline is indicating. And from that then selecting a guideline or other knowledge tool that will address that uh, gap. Uh, we consider adapting the knowledge to the local context. Um, this guideline, vascular access, not written specifically for your site. So to consider what adaptations need to be made to make it meaningful for your local context, for your care providers, for your recipients of care. Important to assess the barriers and facilitators to knowledge use. Um, and that helps us then for the next phase of select, tailor, implement interventions. If we know what some of the barriers are to making the practice change, we can better ensure that when we are developing strategies to support that practice change, that we can address those barriers and also use the facilitators to enable the practice change. Once we've introduced the implementation interventions, those strategies, very often education, but other strategies can be used, then we can monitor the knowledge use. How much are people actually using the best practices in their day-to-day -day practice? That, that leads us then to be able to evaluate the outcomes. We have found from literature that using best practices, using evidence-based practice leads to improved outcomes. So evaluating outcomes gives us that opportunity to be able to assess and confirm that. And then finally, to consider then, assuming that we have effective good response from our best practice guideline, then how to sustain that knowledge. So it is an active process of implementation. And for our leading change toolkit, we have updated the literature. Uh, we separated out the monitor knowledge use and evaluate outcome section, just to um, have a little bit more attention to monitor knowledge use. Oh, we've introduced new KTA tools. These are valid and pragmatic tools that you can use to support some of the action cycle phases. Uh, and finally, we have linked um, elements of this framework to the social movement action framework. So let's look at that one next. Thanks. So the social movement action framework for knowledge uptake and sustainability. This is a brand new framework uh, that we developed as part of the work of the Leading Change Toolkit. Um, social movement action is something that RNAO, as the Professional Association for Nurses, has been using for over two decades. Um, if you are familiar with our action alerts or um, Queen's Park Day, examples of where we are engaging members um, and others in social movement action, um, talking about positioning issues in ways and giving them opportunities to get involved in, in matters that in, that uh, are important to them. And so we wanted to formalize our understanding of social movement action and look at how it can be used to actively support knowledge uptake and sustainability, it's just sort of like the uh, knowledge to action framework. So you can see that this framework is divided into three uh, time points of preconditions, what must be in place in order for social movement action to occur. Um, and this includes that a change is valued and necessary that there is a receptivity to change, meaning there's an energy for change, and that social movements, examples of those are recognized. Key characteristics, what must be present in order for social movement action to occur. So starting with that there is an urgent need for action, it says the catalyst for change. Framing is about how we talk about the change and wanting to make it meaningful, wanting to make it credible so that others want to get actively involved. With social movement action is emerging leadership, especially from informal leaders like point of care or frontline staff. Um, social movement action is about intrinsic motivation. It's a values driven um, change. So it's talking about the change in ways then that uh, connect with hearts and minds. 
Um, social movement action also about taking action together, mobilizing individual and collective action intentionally for change. It is about making that change have a public presence or be publicly visible. It's a way of gaining credibility um, and drawing awareness to the change process. Uh, as a result of individuals engaging in change, the development of a collective identity, uh, the necessity of momentum, we need to have progress. We need to see that that energy is evolving and creating change. The importance of networks as a point, point of connection for people and resources, and finally, the role of a core leadership structure, a change team, for example, who are engaged in, in the change process. And then as far as outcomes, these are the consequences that can occur as a result of social movement action, it includes that goals and outcomes are met. Um, the change, when found to be effective, can be scaled up, out, or deep. And that as a result of engaging in social movement action, we learn more about leading change. Again, both of these frameworks can be applied together. So next, as we um, move to looking at an example of applying the knowledge to action framework to the vascular access EPG, um, we're gonna be focusing largely on the identify problem, determine the no-do gap um, action cycle phase. So often in this phase of the knowledge to action framework, we use an approach called the, the gap analysis. We can also call it an opportunity analysis uh, because it is how we measure the evidence to practice gap. Again, uh, the best practices in a guideline like vascular access compared to our current practice. It's gonna tell us through um, undergoing this process of gap analysis, if change is needed, where and to what extent. It's a very useful tool. In order to do it and do it well, we need two key pieces of information. One, we need to carefully assess what is our current practice. And we can do that many ways. We can look at our policies. We can ask staff. We can observe. We could do chart reviews. We could look at data. But very important that we have a good pulse check on what is current practice. And then to determine then those best practices, obviously we need to read the guideline and, and really fully understand what is it saying about best practice and then be able to do that determination of what is the gap or the difference between current practice and best practice. And we can measure that as far as it being a met uh, recommendation where what the guideline is saying and our current practice align or if it's partially met where we need to make a few changes or where it's unmet, we really need quite a few changes to occur to be able to achieve best practices. Um, so it allows us then to measure our current um, status as far as aligning with best practices, to prioritize um, next steps, um, and then on a regular basis to be able to see what progress we are making. And I think now I'm going to hand it over to Darlene, who's now going to talk about conducting a gap analysis and what it's meant in her site. Thanks, Darlene. Thank you, Catherine. Now we'd like to talk through an example um, using the, the recommendation 5.1 from the vascular access uh, best practice guideline. The recommendation reads, the expert panel recommends that the acute care health service organization implement a multi-component peripheral vascular access device care protocol. This protocol includes a minimum of a daily review by health providers in collaborations with persons and their families. As you can see, this is noted as a strong recommendation and the outcomes were of interest we're, we're focusing on was complication. The multi-component care protocol includes a per peripheral vascular access daily review and documentation and at least one of the following interventions, hand hygiene, Aseptic care tech and aseptic care techniques, provider education uh, and training, person and family and caregiver involvement, standardized PVAD equipment, as well as a standardized securement device, and the inclusion of a PVAD assessment at rounds or handover. Next slide, please. So, conducting that gap analysis, if we wanted to connect 
could, sorry about that, if we wanted to conduct a gap analysis using this uh, recommendation, the first step would be to compare what the current practice is at your organization compared to what the recommendation is, is stating. So for example, at ZipKids, we currently as assess our PVEDs hourly using a standardized assessment tool. The nurses document this assessment in the electronic uh, record every hour, and they use this tool also during handovers and, um, and shift change during our current, with, in line with our current policy. Also, during orientation, nurses complete an e-learning related to PVAD care bundles. In addition, they work on the units with their preceptor to complete a competency checklist. So this is in line with the recommendation. Therefore, we could state the recommendation has been met. If, however, as an educator, I was looking at this recommendation and realizing that there is no standardized policy regarding assessment, staff are not getting any education on assessment, um, the practice is not supported well in our electronic documentation system, then I would say this recommendation is unmet and there would be a lot of work on focusing on the changes that need to happen in order to meet the recommendation. Or perhaps um, we are partially meeting this um, recommendation. We know that nurses are assessing their PVADs on an hourly basis and we have a policy in place, but they don't have the right tools to do proper documentation, then I would say we are meeting this recommendation uh, partially and we need to do some minor changes. So on the screen here, you will see, um, we've also included this in the P PBGs to help with this implementation of this particular uh, recommendation. This is an example of the PVAD assessment protocol that we use at my organization. It uh, outlines four important steps uh, of what we call the touch, look, compare plus uh, framework. Touch, meaning we touch that PVAD every 60 minutes to assess to make sure it's soft, warm, dry, pain-free. We look at that PVAD every 60 minutes to make sure there's no redness or blanching. And then we compare uh, looking at the PVAD site with the opposite hand and limb to make sure that there's no swelling and both sides are equal in size. So additionally, health providers engage the child and their family and educate them on the importance of hourly assessments. Also give them knowledge about signs and symptoms of complications related to that peripheral vascular access device. And we really encourage the child and family to speak up if they have any concerns. So this is the frame that we, we use, we call it IV Care with TLC Plus, and you can find this appendix on 141 of the best practice guideline. All right, so here, just give me a moment. So there are a few resources that can help you implement this guideline in your practice if you wish. We encourage you to read the guideline, uh, which is available uh, free online or a hard copy can be ordered. I know today we did a very high level overview of the guideline, but we hope you will take the time to read the guideline thoroughly as it includes some evidence in detail and the appendix and resources are quite helpful and perhaps discuss its implement, implement, implications for your particular organization with your colleagues. There is also a health education fact sheet available online, which can be used by health pro providers to aid in health teaching with their patient and clients who have vascular access devices. In the future, we also hope to publish and make available a mobile app on this guideline, which will outline best practices and point of care resources to be used by frontline care. Please do look out for that. Um, given that the guideline is around 150 pages, we understand that it's not always feasible to be carrying it with you in practice. Thus, we will be summarized pertinent information that is accessible via a mobile app. It's not meant to be a replacement for the full guideline, so we do hope you will read it as well. 
And if you're interested, you can also become a best practice champion through our best practice champion network. RNAO has free e-learning courses, virtual learning series, and hosts in-person work workshops that will walk you through the process and the steps it takes in order to take this guideline like the and like the vascular access and put it into practice. You may also be interested in learning more about becoming a best practice spotlight organ organization. Um, the, B, the BPSO program is a key organizational knowledge, knowledge translation strategy, which supports best practice guidelines implementation, rapid learning and evidence-based practice sustainability. A, a BPSO designation is important for the health service and academic organization to formally partner with RNAO over a three-year period to achieve designation. The goal is to create evidence-based practice culture throughout this, the systemic implementation and evaluation of the multiple RNAO uh, clinical best practice guidelines. I will now pass it over to Christine to tell us more about evaluation and monitoring. Thank you so much, Darlene and, and Catherine. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm the Senior Manager of Evaluation and Monitoring at the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. And I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about evaluation and monitoring. So um, on our next slide, we can see um, our integrated BPG model and what is circled as the monitoring and evaluation pillar, which is what I'll be covering. So for those who are um, new to evaluation, um, it'll be helpful to start with a definition of evaluation. So according to the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, evaluation is defined as a systematic collection of information about the activities, characteristics, and outcomes of programs, services, policy, or processes to make judgments about the program, improve effectiveness, and or inform decisions about future development. Here at RNAO, we use the Donna Bedian framework, which is a widely used framework for assessing quality of care to guide the development of our BPG-based quality indicators. According to this framework, there are three types of indicators to measure the impact of the implementation of guidelines. And this includes the indicators of structure, process, and outcome. Structure indicators are indicators that provide context about the human resource factors of the environment in which, in which care occurs. For example, this can include nursing hours per patient day, absenteeism, or turnover. This data is often found within the HR, payroll, or finance departments. Process indicators are indicators that represent practical re recommendations that are being implemented. In other words, what is done by and for persons in, in the process of providing care. So this can, um, a good example of this can include percentage of persons with pressure injuries that received comprehensive assessment on initiation of care. Outcome indicators are indicators that inform whether the implementation of the guideline is having the desired impact. And this represents the effective care on the health status of persons. For example, this may include percentage of falls, percentage of persons with pressure injuries that, that worsened, and other types of outcome indicators. It's important to collect on, three type, on all three types of indicators to describe an observed trend in the implementation of best practice guidelines and its impact. So here we can see the important link between best practice guidelines and quality indicators. So best practice guidelines define how to improve quality of care, whereas quality indicators measure how much improvement has occurred. Both are based upon best available evidence and developed through structured processes, which I'll go, to, I'll go through in a minute. Um, however, best practice guidelines describe what should be done and quality indicators measure if it is being done and how well it is being done. Um, as I said, as I mentioned before, um, I'm going to give you an overview of our indicator development process. We currently have six steps. So the first step includes guideline selection, where indicators are developed for clinical BPGs that are being developed for a variety of different reasons. The next step is extraction of recommendations. So in this step, the drafted practice recommendations, overall guideline outcomes, and previous editions of the best practice guidelines are reviewed to extract potential measures for indicator development. The third step is indicator selection and development, which includes drafting outcome and process indicators with the expert panel and selecting the indicators suitable to include for BPG evaluation. 
The next step is practice test and validation, where the proposed indicators will be externally validated through the use of a validation survey with our external stakeholder group. Next is implementation. So these indicators are published in the evaluation and monitoring chart of the BPG. And the final step is assessment and evaluation where we conduct uh, data quality assessments and gain some feedback from organizations to ensure purposeful evolution of our indicators and to help inform future uh, best practice guideline development and implementation. So there are a variety of different types of considerations that we use um, in terms of indicator development. So we ask ourselves, are there, um, is there an, an adequate body of evidence, strength of recommendations and rationale? So are these indicators uh, evidence-based? Are they relevant or important? So is the indicator clinically relevant and important to measure? Are the indicators feasible or measurable? So can the indicator be collected with current resources available? And are there data sources that can potentially be used to measure the indicator? And is the indicator actual or usable? Does the indicator support decision-making within organizations? We also consider whether the indicator is nursing sensitive, as well as if the indicator is interpretable or readable. So is the data resulting from the indicator clear, understandable, and easy to interpret? And is the indicator a language easy to read and understand? So I'm gonna give you um, uh, an, an example in our evaluation monitoring chart of this best practice guideline. So this is the first page. It just kind of gives you a bit of a preamble about the Donabedian model. So here we can see um, a process indicator, which is mapped on a recommendation 5.1, which the recommendation reads, uh, the expert panel recommends that acute care health service organizations implement a multi-component peripheral vascular access device care protocol. This protocol includes a minimum of a daily review by health providers in collaboration with persons and their families. So this was a strong recommendation, which is um, another one of our criteria for making process indicators and structure indicators. And that's how we gained, uh, we developed our process indicator percentage of persons with a peripheral vascular access device who received care according to a multi-component peripheral vascular access uh, device care protocol, which includes a minimum of a daily review of the peripheral vascular access device and site. And we also align it with external data repositories to really um, decrease that, uh, that data collection and reporting burden. And now we have the outcome indicator, which is mapped to uh, the outcome of in interest, which was uh, complications. So the outcome indicator in itself is percentage of persons who experience peripheral vascular access device related complications. And again, we um, align it with external uh, data repositories and instruments. So we can really see the, uh, the link between the recommendations and the outcomes in terms of process structure and outcome indicators. Thanks so much, Christina. And thank you to all our presenters today for that great information on implementation and evaluation of our vascular access BPG. For those of you who may be interested in getting involved with our BPGs in the future, um, perhaps as an expert panel member or a stakeholder reviewer, please head to our website listed here to apply. And if you aren't yet a member of RNAO and you would like to join, um, visit join.rnao.ca to join now and enjoy a whole year of benefits, including personal liability protection and some other great perks listed on the slide here. So we really encourage you to download the guideline and have a read. And if you have any questions regarding the guideline itself or any questions about implementation or evaluation of the guideline, please feel free to contact Amy on the, at the email address listed here, or you can also contact us through our contact us form on the RNAO website at rnao.ca. So now we'd love to hear from you. We have a few discussion questions listed here on the screen, but feel free to also ask some other questions or add additional comments in the chat box. Um, so we're, we'd love to hear what some of your reflections are on the BPG after these two webinars. Um, how are you planning on implementing the BPG in your organization? And how are you planning on evaluating the BPG in your organization? Um, if you have a longer question or point for discussion, please feel free to raise your hand or place a request in the chat box as well and we can unmute you. Um, I think we do have 
one raised hand and I think there was one Q&A question already for us to discuss. So maybe we could start with those. And then um, any other questions, feel free to type in the chat box as well. And we'll um, hopefully get to all the questions. We have about 15 minutes left, I think. So we'll um, get started with that. Um, so I think there was a question already answered in the Q and A. Um, I'm not sure if everyone can read that or if I should read that out. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It was such a long um, uh, answer that I thought I'd get a jump on it and include some details for you. And then certainly we can go into more information. Uh, I think the question was very specific to um, how do we get education on vascular access devices? And it's kind of a broad question. Um, hey, Darlene, you might want to comment on what you do within your facility in order to keep nursing staff up to date on vascular access devices, usage, insertion, et cetera. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, probably during the presentation, we do spend a fair bit of um, education when they're onboarded into the organization, both on um, peripheral vascular access devices, in addition to um, central venous access devices in our organization. Um, with that, we've got competencies um, in their orientation checklist. In addition, we do, uh, we're lucky enough to have um, observation uh, practice experts that do audit now and again, um, more supposed so probably around central venous access devices, but we hope to do the same with peripheral vascular access devices, just sort of get a sense of um, practice, current practice at the front line. And also these coaches then provide, um, you know, bedside mentoring and education sort of just in time as necessary. So we're sort of always looking at our practice and trying to audit and fill in gaps where we need them. So hopefully that uh, helps answer th that. And we have lots yeah. of policies. Well, and, and I would also encourage kind of a variety of education. What we've seen within other guidelines and recommendations is that the best, at, the best type of education is, you know, utilizing a hybrid approach where you have not only uh, with hospital education that has been developed and designed within each facility, but also reaching out for others. Now, I will freely admit I am biased in this regard because Pick Excellence is an educational provider. But based on the research that I've done in publications in conjunction with others, we definitely find that you, you don't wanna be isolated in your education, isolated either in, in terms of your facility or even of your country, because there's a lot of good education and guidelines, recommendations and standards in the lower 50, but also in Europe and other locations. So we have to look at the research and the, the recommendations from other areas as well. And the best way to do that may be through organizations like SEVA, the Canadian Vascular Access Society Association, through AVA, the Association for Vascular Access, through INS, the Infusion Nurses Society, as well as Gavisel and WACOVA, the World Congress of Vascular Access. Um, many, many other uh, organizations also have education on their websites. So there's a lot of resources that are available for vascular access, but I do encourage you to make sure that those resources include um, updated information on things like best practice guidelines. I, I have always been supportive of the RNAO process and feel like it is one of the best worldwide and it needs to be included in the education of any company. Mm, can't agree with you more, Nancy. That was a nice uh, outline of sort of where you go to get the best practice information. Um, I don't see any other comments in the chat box at the moment. Oh, there is a question here from Jennifer. Um, I have a question about the recommendation 1.1 on providers providing health teaching to clients and families. On page 43 
uh, it mentions the certainty of the evidence effects is very low. Can you explain what this means? So uh, I can take a stab at this. Uh, this kind of speaks to Jennifer um, in webinar one, we went through in a lot more detail the grade methodology and what the certainty of the evidence of effects means. So um, the evidence here, we did systematic review uh, on regarding recommendation 1.1 and found that the evidence was very low. And if you look um, kind of to the discussion of evidence section, um, it discusses some of the benefits and harms that we found, some of the health equity considerations, and some of the values and preferences that were found in the literature. And that um, kind of goes through what we found and why some of that was found to be very low. Um, I'm not sure if Amy, Nancy, or Geraldine, you wanted to add anything else to that? Yeah, I mean, from a practical sense, we definitely recognize that the research that we have available on a high level is limited, especially in terms of you know, providing um, outcomes from healthcare teaching to clients, families, and others. Uh, you know, we're, in order to establish a strong recommendation for these, um, these individual points, we need solid research. Uh, we're all looking for evidence-based practice, and yet that's really limited for these types of topics. So had to state uncertain uh, rather than strong based on the level of evidence that was available. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Christine and Nancy. And um, as Christine mentioned, you can find more detail in that discussion of, of evidence. But um, for this question in particular, Grade is very grade is the system that we use to uh, determine the overall quality of evidence uh, based on outcomes, and it's a very rigorous system, um, and it often does penalize quite a bit studies that are not um, traditional randomized control studies. So, for this example, um, we mostly had fairly small scale studies that were um, probably before and after studies where um, an organization had implemented a certain uh, education program and they were looking at outcomes before and afterwards so that is penalized quite a bit just based on the methodology that they used compared to a large study that actually randomizes people to to two different groups so I hope that helps to understand a little bit of why that uh, harsh rating came about. Well, and I guess I would add that while we would very like, very much like to go on expert opinion, because we know that certain things should be done and that they will result in better outcomes, um, the proof is in the pudding. We, we have to have the research to prove it. So opinion only goes so far. Thank you, Nancy. Um, we just have a follow-up here question here too. Um, I'm curious to know if there are any recommendations for where health teaching should be documented in the health record. Um, and I think she's referring to the practice notes that we list on page 45. So Nancy or Darlene, any examples you wanna give on that? Or I'll have to leave that with you guys because um, in the lower 50, we're using electronic medical records such as Epic and Cerner. And I think some of your hospitals also have those, but I'm not sure how many. And within the electronic medical record, specifically EPIC, there are sections that allow um, documentation of education in, um, in a specific pathway. I agree, Nancy. That's what we have EPIC at our organization, okay. and that has all been built in, um, mm -hmm. especially for, yeah, for family teaching. Um, it's a big component of what we do. So... Um, we've built it in and made sure it was part of our process. Excellent. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, one of the things that's coming over time, I think, with our electronic medical records is not only the ability to document, but also the ability to print off um, written information for our, our persons that are receiving care with vascular access devices. So um, I, I highly recommend uh, printing it and not only providing verbal education to your patients, but also um, provide them with some written information. 
And, and of course, the best practice guidelines are also starting to include more information on lived experience persons um, that uh, gives uh, information for those patients, for those people that, that have vascular access devices and those people who care for them. And I guess one other thing that I might add at this point is um, in, in terms of the education and kind of going back to the previous question, I mentioned manufacturer education. Um, in Canada, you've got some excellent infusion pharmacies and clinicians that work within those pharmacies that provide some fantastic education. They're great resources. You can contact them and ask them questions as well, and even set up for annual education or regular reviews. The, um, the SEVA and other organizations do have annual education programs. The ability to evaluate clinicians based on electronic medical re record results and outcomes and um, competency checklists is part of what we really should be doing in order to ensure that the outcomes are what we're expecting, what we're, we, we want to have for our, our, our persons with vascular access devices. Thanks, Nancy. Um, not sure if there's any other questions or points for discussion that people have. Uh, feel free to also raise your hand if you'd like to uh, be unmuted and we're happy to um, answer questions that way as well. Thanks, Jennifer, for the clarification on uh, what you're doing within your home care setting and your electronic medical record. Uh, utilizing a client education checklist is super. It really makes sure that you cover all the pertinent topics. I love checklists because I always forget something and it's nice to be able to go through and I uh, systematically cover all the points. Okay, I don't see any more um, questions coming in through the chat or the Q&A, and we're just creeping up to the top of the hour. Um, so I guess I'll just remind attendees that if there's any questions that um, we didn't get a chance to cover today or you think of afterwards that um, you can get in contact with me via email um, as well as through the contact us on the website. I may not know the answer, but I, I'm happy to be the, the middle woman and um, put you in touch with someone that, that can better help. Um, and maybe I'll just ask our panelists and our lovely co-chairs if they have any final thoughts before we wrap up this afternoon? Download it, read it. It's a good piece can, of work. If I can just add, um, we really appreciate co-chairs, their um, support for RNAOs, BPGs, the quality of them. And I think the credibility goes a long ways. Um, and big thanks to educators uh, like Darlene and Nancy really helped to support move this knowledge into practice. So we do hope that you found today helpful. And again, thanks to co-chairs for their continued support of our BPGs. I would say it's a great experience for anybody if they're interested to be part of this. They learned so much along the way. So highly recommend being part of the process. Fantastic and impressive group of people that are working within the RNAO um, that the whole process, the systematic review and the methodologist, wow, you, you guys should be really proud of your country and your organization. And as, as an outsider from the United States, um, I, I am quite honored to have been involved with this process. It's amazing. Okay, thanks so much for those wrapping up words and um... We, uh, we hope to see you again at a, at a future event. And thanks so much for taking the time out of your busy days. I know everyone has so many priorities these days. So thank you for joining us this afternoon. Take care. Thanks everyone.